now called together, called by bell and bird, called by oak leaf and pine needle, called by the beat of our hearts, to join again the living tradition we share, to answer again the call to wisdom and to respond to love. Today with the bell ringing from Big Ben in London and the nightingale singing in Africa and Europe. Let us remember the third and fourth of our tradition's sources. Wisdom from the world's religions which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life and Jewish and Christian teachings which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. I'll invite you all to take a moment to silence your cell phones. And a quick word about our singing this morning. We invite and encourage and enthusiastically hope you will sing along behind your masks. Those of us who are up here on the chancel, uh, unmasked and who might be singing, test every week to make sure we are singing for you safely. It's just a word to remind you about that. So we will start with hymn number 188. You will see the lyrics on your screens. It is around and we're going to encourage you Oh, bravery with the with some of the numbers I see, right? So I'm going to ask Christian, if you don't mind stepping away from the board back there to lead one of the sections. I'll have section one over here. Reverend Meredith will have section two over here. Terry, can I trouble you for section three? And section four, Christian will weave you in. So what we'll do is we'll hear it once on the piano. We'll sing it all together one time, and then we'll break into parts. We'll lead you along. Don't worry. Good morning. I'm, I'm Reverend Meredith Garman, minister of this congregation, community, Unitarian, Universalist at White Plains, New York, land formerly of the Lenape Nation. And I'm Kim Force of the Worship Committee, serving today as your worship associate as well as your hymn leader. Hi, Sadie. The mission of our congregation is to nurture each other in our spiritual journeys, foster compassion and understanding within and beyond our community, and engage in service to transform ourselves and our world. 
and our vision is that our congregation will be a wealthy sanctuary of walls. Liked until now. Um, <laughs> that promotes diversity, fellowship, spiritual growth and inspiration while committing to people and the planet through social action and service. Today is the 11th Sunday of winter, two more to go. The new moon began on Wednesday and is now waxing crescent. The length of daytime today in White Plains is up to 11 hours, 33 minutes. And on the Christian calendar, it's the first Sunday of Lent. Last week, we visited family up in Maine and got to enjoy a big old snowstorm. We lit a fire in the fireplace and played cards with the kids during the storm. But the next day, we went sledding. And I confess, I went down the hill one time and didn't even hurt myself. Thank you. Uh, now that we're back home, I am very much looking forward to the thawing and the welcoming of spring. Thank you, Kim. At a time of year noted for meteorological volatility, I embraced the changeability from 75 degree sunny weather last weekend in Santa Barbara, where I was participating in a festival of Jewish music, to 16 degrees with powdery snow in Oneonta when I returned early Wednesday morning. <laughs> A special welcome to our visitors. We are honored to have you here with us today. If you're new here today and in our sanctuary, we invite you to stand or wave a hand just so that we might recognize you and welcome you. Welcome. And if you're joining us online, we invite you to take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat. And you will find a link to the order of service on our website at cucwp.org. Our website also offers information to help keep us connected as well as a donate button. If you have a joy, sorrow, or milestone you'd like to share, you may write it in our Joys and Sorrows book on the table with the white tablecloth to my right. And for those of you at home on Zoom, please enter it into the chat. And if you do it that way, make sure you make the first word joy, sorrow, or milestone so that at the end of the prayer, I'll know which chat entries to, are meant for me to speak. We'll now have our board member, Karen Leahy, light our chalice. And for those of you watching at home, please light a chalice or candle along with Karen. Good morning, everybody. So good to see people. It's so good to be together in person by the miracle of modern technology on Zoom, both locally and around the country. It's lovely to be together and we have survived this far, maybe with heavier hearts, but now today we rejoice to be together. So. Hmm. On the 11th Sunday of the season, we dedicate our chalice to the third and fourth sources of the living tradition we share, wisdom from the world's religions, which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life, and Jewish and Christian teachings, which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Please join in the responsive chalice lighting in your order of service and on the screen, and please respond with the words in italics. Blessed is the fire of our faith and the chalice of our community. Blessed is the transient flame we kindle here. Blessed is the illuminated moment of our gathering. Blessed is the light of the eternal. Blessed is the sacred, sacred call of life to which we give ourselves in answer. Our spoken invocation this morning is adapted and expanded from words by Alison Wohler. It is good to be together. With thankful hearts, we have come together this morning. Giddy with delight to be together again, <laughs> embodying our community. To see each other in all three of our dimensions. To look into each other's eyes, behold each other's faces, the top half anyway. And to converse together without having to remind each other, you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's the, so, button, the lower left button. It's a microphone. <laughs> it might have a line through it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We can hear you now. <laughs> to congregate as congregations do and have done for thousands of years. It is so good to be together. With thankful hearts, we come together this morning at last. To bask in the warmth of this community, too long attenuated through Zoom. To share with friends the tides of our lives with voices unmediated by electronics. To entertain perennially our hopes for a better future. We join together this morning as we always do to resist injustice and inequality as we have through Zoom times as we do now at last again in person. We feel around us human need in our sanctuary, in our world, and our hearts are touched for this is how our lives are best lived. In questioning and in conversation, in compassion and in service, in gratitude and in joy, in companionship and in love. It is so good to be together again at last. And now please join in singing our sung invocation 318, We Would Be One. Words are on the screen. We would be one as now we join in singing our hymn of love to pledge ourselves anew to that high cause of greater understanding of who we are and what in us is true. We would be one in living for each other to show to all a new community. We would be one in building for tomorrow a nobler known today. We would be one in searching for that meaning which bends our hearts and points us on our way. As one we pledge ourselves to greater service with love and justice strive to make us free. And today's UU Minute video is number 77, Likeness to God. William Ellery Channing's 1819 Manifesto, Unitarian Christianity, embraced the name Unitarian for the liberal Congregationalists and laid out principles that remain key to who we are. Channing was the intellectual, moral, and spiritual leader of Unitarianism for 23 more years until his death at age 62. Ralph Waldo Emerson himself referred to Channing as our bishop. Channing rejected Trinitarianism, the point for which we Unitarians get our name. He also, like Unitarian forebears Fausto Sozzini and Joseph Priestley, rejected substitutionary atonement. In an 1828 sermon, Likeness to God, Channing essentially addressed the question, Who made whom in whose image? Channing's answer was one many of us today would still affirm. He said, the divine attributes are first developed in ourselves and thence transferred to our Creator. The idea of God, sublime and awful as it is, is the idea of our own spiritual nature purified and enlarged to infinity. In ourselves are the elements of the divinity. Channing went on to say that humans had transcendent moral reason as part of our higher or spiritual nature that has its foundations in the original and essential capacities of the mind. Inscribed on the back of the William Ellery Channing statue that stands in Boston's public garden 
is a further passage from this same sermon. I do and I must reverence human nature. I bless it for its kind affections. I honor it for its achievements in science and art, and still more for its examples of heroic and saintly virtue. These are marks of a divine origin and the pledges of a celestial inheritance, and I thank God that my own lot is bound up with that of the human race. Uh, so, as I mentioned, my name is Kim Force. Uh, my dad's side of the family is Irish American. My mom's is Ukrainian American. On the left side of the screen there is my mom's grandparents who had just immigrated to the U.S. in about 1906, and their four children. And it's funny, I have cousins who are the spitting images of these children here. I'm told my brother and I have the Armstrong face, which is my dad's side of the family. But I don't know, we have some of that Ukrainian too. Um, the, that's the Heisa family. And my great-grandmother, Barbara, her maiden name was Boyko. They immigrated to the U.S. from Western Ukraine. The borders moved around a lot. So part of it is Poland now. Uh, we think they came to enjoy a better life here in America. Uh, my grandfather's parents, the Witenkos, Bichenko, we think it got Americanized on Ellis Island. They came around the same time. And these families all socialized in a very tightly knit community on the Lower East Side. Both families uh, attended St. George's Ukrainian Church on East 7th Street. And my father, the Irishman, will scold me if I don't mention that McSorley's Ale House is right across the street from St. George's. On East 7th Street, there used to be a wonderful Ukrainian gift shop that I would go down to and thumb through books with language I didn't understand. Uh, look through records and cards and carvings and the whole place smelled like my grand's house, actually. So my grand and grandpa, they're in the middle there at their wedding at St. George's, and that's in about 1938. Um, the shorter gentleman on the right-hand side is my uncle Paul Heisa. On the left is my uh, great aunt Jenny. She and my grandmother did not get along, but that is a story for a different day. And on the upper right there, that is Barbara holding her grandchild, Barbara. And that was my Aunt Barbara and my great-grandmother Barbara. And then down there, that uh, the, the, the lady um, missing some teeth is also holding Barbara. And that was Anna. That was Grandma Anna. So my mom tells me that the women in the family spoke excellent English and the men did not. Uh, they stayed in the Ukrainian enclave. My great-grandfather, George, George and Stephen, George, um, was a deacon at St. George's Ukrainian Cathedral. And St. George's still live cast their services, if you want to check that out on Facebook. They're super cool. Uh, the reason I tell you all this is that we've watched the unfurling of world events. I mean, pick, pick the feeling, and we've all had them in the last couple of weeks. It's awful. It's awful what's happening to the people of Ukraine. They're flooding into Eastern Europe in record amounts. Uh, the countries are welcoming with open arms, but there are so many things that are needed. Uh, so we have partnered with, this congregation has partnered with the UUSC. Uh, if you could show me the next slide, Christian. The Ukrainian uh, response is being coordinated by the USC, and they are going to help funnel our donations to the right places. And these are folks who need our help. And this is the way to live our values, to live our values in public. Let's help the people who are maintaining, trying to maintain their homeland, and let's support them in any way we can. So our plate share for the month of March will continue to support the UUSC's Emergency Relief Fund. And we invite you to give often, give well. If you do donate online, PayPal does have an opportunity to just check a box that says, make my donation recurring. I do that because I forget to go in every week. Uh, and it is a good way just to keep the funds flowing where they need to go. Um, thank you for your compassion. And to all of you who may have family in Ukraine or Eastern Europe, uh, or elsewhere that are being impacted by these world events. We are with you and we are here together and let's help each other 
and through this world crisis. And now we come to the offering. The living tradition we share draws on wisdom from the world's religions, which inspire us in our ethical and spiritual life, including Jewish and Christian teachings that call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. When Jesus asked, which commandment is the greatest of all? He answers, you shall love. Love the vast, interconnected, inclusive, and creative whole with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Loving the world, ourselves, and our neighbors, a single joy manifests in both gratitude and generosity. What is ours to do is sustain the heritage given. Thank, thank you, Kim. I don't think I'm gone yet. I think that's for later in the service. Uh, uh, but in any case, all of this morning's solo piano music is by the Norwegian-born Unitarian composer Edvard Grieg, whose music I play very often here. Uh, I think he embodied the virtue of humility in part by centering the voices of people of all classes, as in this peasant's march. Will you pray with me? Dear spirits of life and love, our hearts and minds go out to Ukraine as we witness the devastation of the 
unconscionable Russian invasion. We are horrified by the assault, the effects we have already seen, and we are frightened by what yet may come. Dear spirit of life and love, we must humbly acknowledge the racial component to the level of alarm felt in Europe and America when casualty levels in African conflicts were at the levels they now are in Ukraine, or when control of a similarly sized population on a similarly sized area was at stake outside of Europe and North America, then few Americans paid much heed. As European countries open their doors and their arms to over a million Ukrainian refugees. Let's remember that darker skinned refugees have in the last decade received much less welcome. And indeed, even now, some darker skinned citizens of other countries caught in Ukraine and trying to get out find themselves turned back. Yes, let that be remembered. And let's continue to do what we can to build a world of peace, equality, democracy, freedom, sustainability, and reasonable living standards for all the people of Earth. And at the same time, the Ukrainian war has many aspects. And the fact that Ukraine is a predominantly white country is only one of those aspects, particularly salient, is that a world nuclear power is committing this particular atrocity and that this war carries greater threats for a more worldwide instability than conflicts in other parts of the world generally have. In any case, we pray to remember that we are not separate from the world. We weren't separate from the Rwandan genocide in 1994, even if at the time we believed we were. We aren't separate from the Yemeni war that's been going on since 2014, and we aren't separate from Russia's war in Ukraine now. Their suffering is yours and mine. Vaclav Havel, the renowned Czech writer turned president, once said that morality means taking responsibility, not only of your life, but for the life of the world. So let us turn our attention to this fact. We are not separate. Comprehending non-separation. We are not complacent. We are not restless. Comprehending non-separation. We are open to discover and bear witness and hold this reality too with a strong back and a soft front. Nothing is other. We cannot turn away from the suffering, whether in Ukraine or in Afghanistan or in Port Chester. We all live under each other's skin. We ask of ourselves the mindful intention to delight in what is good, to confront what is cruel, to heal what is broken. Amen. And we observe now 60 seconds of silence. Oh, we give thanks for 
for this precious day for all gathered here and those far away for this time we share with love and care oh we give thanks for this precious day oh we give thanks for this precious day for all gathered here and those far away for this time we share with love and care oh we give thanks for this precious day It's time again for our eco-spiritual practice for this month, brought to you by Community UU's Environmental Practices Social Justice Team. Letting go, moving forward. It is challenging work, yet necessary, to deconstruct comfortable ways of being in the world, rethink identity, and let go of beliefs that no longer function for us. We must reclaim the holy ground, re-sanctify, rebuild, and reimagine. Hostility and competitiveness may seem to be ascendant, but behind the scenes of authoritarian violence and narcissism, a new paradigm is emerging of earth community, balance, and cooperation. We have perhaps begun to shed the old, but scarcely imagined what the new paradigm might look like. We don't know if the larger culture will ever be transformed, short of destroying itself. Yet, here we are. Regardless of what the culture does, we embrace our life's task, our own personal great work. And we let go of the idea of an endless, unlimited earth, of our addiction to stuff, to consumerism, to symbols of success and status. It is unsettling to be disconnected from the dominant cultural paradigm, but to have no well-formed alternative in which to be grounded. This in-between place is a temporary but necessary stopover in the process of change. 
Eco-spiritual practices for this month include a ritual of release and a guided meditation to visualize letting go of burdens. For the details on these as well as group activities for your eco-spiritual group, see the post at cucmatters.org. The link is in your e-communitarian. Our theme for the month of March is humility. And you are probably not going, hooray, humility! (laughs) We Unitarian Universalists are often not great with the humility thing. We tend to be a bit suspicious of it for a number of reasons. And what I'll do today is go through a list of those reasons. One by one, we will consider five difficulties with the idea of humility. And then we'll look at a kind of humility that I think Unitarians actually have taken to heart and embody. That is, I'd say, the essence of Unitarian Universalism. The first difficulty is the idea that humility means putting yourself down. This is the simplest one to dispense with. That's not what we're talking about. Humility is not exemplified by someone who's always putting themselves down. They might be doing it because they really have low self-esteem, or maybe they're very insecure and need you to contradict their bad assessment and tell them that they're fine. Either way, that's not humility. Putting yourself down is not humility because it's still focused on you. Prideful, boasting, arrogance is one way to be focused on yourself. Abasing yourself is another way to be focused on yourself. These apparent opposites, having a very high opinion of yourself and having a very low opinion of yourself, share a preoccupation with the self. They both put the self at the center. Humility is about decentering the self focusing on others, shifting focus away from oneself and toward the situation at hand, toward the present needs, toward the task, toward serving. Humility, as C.S. Lewis nicely put it, isn't thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. A self-centered life is barren and sterile. A saying that's been circulating in various versions for over a century is that a person all wrapped up in yourself makes a small package. Humility is not denying that we have worth and value. It's simply a focus on serving others rather than on what others think of us. Even when we are clear about that, clear that humility is not about thinking you don't matter, but about being unconcerned with mattering and just responding to the needs of the situations. Unitarians may remain unconvinced that humility has value. By all means, some of us might say, let us value service and compassion, being respectful, considerate, and kind. But if we value and practice these things, then it is enough to value and practice these things. We don't need an additional value called humility. So that's the second difficulty, the idea that humility is superfluous and unhelpful redundancy. If the argument for humility is that it orients us towards service and compassion, then why not focus directly on the service and compassion and skip the humility? Indeed, there are some strands within the Western philosophical tradition that might seem to suggest we not regard humility as a virtue. Aristotle, for instance, wrote at length about the virtues and becoming a virtuous person, and he does not seem to have regarded humility as one of the virtues. Aristotle's idea of the ideal person was someone he called great-souled. Such a person deserves honors and knows he deserves honors. For Aristotle, The important virtues are wisdom, prudence, justice, fortitude, courage, liberality, magnificence, magnanimity, and temperance. A person who has those virtues is justified in claiming to have them. No need to be humble about it. 
18th century Scottish philosopher, David Hume, said that humility was a monkish pseudo value, pseudo virtue, along with celibacy, fasting, silence, and solitude. These pseudo virtues, Hume said, stupefy the understanding and harden the heart, obscure the fancy and sour the temper. If you're great, isn't it okay to know that you're great and not pretend otherwise? But again, humility isn't thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less. Aristotelian virtues such as courage and liberality require an orientation toward needs other than your own. So humility would have a role in enabling those other virtues. And Hume himself did recognize that impudence and arrogance were problematic and that a due attention and regard for others was an important trait. The thing is, focusing directly on service and compassion doesn't always succeed. We have egos and mechanisms to protect and defend those egos. And those are fine when they help us stand up for what's rightfully ours or help keep us safe, but those ego protections can get in the way. They can manifest as arrogance and steer us away from compassionate service or away from any of Aristotle's virtues. So humility is an enabling virtue. That is paying attention to the idea of humility helps tame the impulse to arrogance so that we can be better oriented towards service, respect, kindness, compassion, and consideration, or toward wisdom, prudence, justice, fortitude, courage, liberality, magnificence, magnanimity, and temperance. Humility, along with patience and self-control and courage helps us overcome the impulses and inclinations that run contrary to virtue. As such, humility has a crucial role in the development of virtue. This raises, however, a third difficulty, and that is that humility is so tricky to self-assess. If we're thinking about the development of our virtues, then don't we need to have some sense of how much development has happened at any given point along our way? How are we doing? What's, what's our place in the arc of progress here? Accurately assessing how patient you are, say, or how courageous isn't exactly easy, but the idea that it is at least possible for a person to discern that Z is reasonably good in these areas makes sense. There's no self-contradiction about that. But if you think you're good at humility, well, doesn't that prove you aren't? Saying I'm humble sounds like a self-undermining joke in a way that saying I'm compassionate or I treat people fairly does not. When it comes to humility, it seems that realizing you have it somehow spoils it. If you have it, you won't know it. And if you seem to know you have it, you probably don't really. <laughs> On this point, I can do no better than suggest we take our cue from the recovery community. One of their slogans is always recovering, never recovered. Self-assessment of how much progress you've made is not, after all, necessary. Just stay on the path. You don't need to know how far you've come. You don't need to know how much further you have to go. Just stay on the path. When it comes to our addictions, to ego and to our ego protection mechanisms, just as with addiction to alcohol, there's no points of being recovered, never a time when you can say, mission accomplished. There's only staying on the path of recovering. And if you notice that you fell off the wagon, do your best to climb back on. The fourth difficulty some Unitarians have with humility is that we can be proud of the way we are, and we don't want to let go of that. We're proud of our intellects and our schooling, and I'll pick up with this one after we have an interlude with our own Edvard Grieg and our own Adam Kent. Thank you, Reverend Meredith. Uh, uh, another work by Edvard Grieg who embodied the virtue of humility as well in 
his centering of the natural world as in this late work, Woodland Peace. The fourth difficulty that some Unitarians have with humility, I was saying, is that we can be proud of the way we are, and we don't want to let that go. Many of us have a lot of education. I do, because I enjoyed wrestling with recondite texts and then meeting with others in classrooms and seminars to talk about them. That was my idea of fun, and I had enough generational privilege to be able to do that. Many of us tend to be proud of our schooling and our erudition. Those years in school were good for something, we are convinced. They improved us. They made us better than we were. 
And we might not like to admit out loud to the logical train that follows from that, but our egos put two and two together. If we now are better than our less educated former selves, and if our less educated former selves were the equals of their peers, then it logically follows that we now are better than those peers who didn't get the improvement. So there's some hubris there. It was years after my last degree before I gradually started to think of those years in school less in terms of how wonderful it was to get educated and more in terms that I just used. Going to school was just something I enjoyed doing and had the privilege to be able to. Yes, it changed and shaped me, but anything else I'd have done during those years would also have changed and shaped me. Experiences can make us wiser if we have the temperament to let them, but experiences of reading books or of sitting in classrooms are no more likely to do so than experiences of lots of other kinds. Still, the hubris of thinking otherwise is a common affliction among Unitarian Universalists, and I confess my own antibodies for that affliction do not always suffice to keep me symptom-free. And that's the fourth difficulty we might have with humility. Setting aside our hubris is no easy thing, but it's crucial if we are to be more welcoming of diversity, including diverse paths to maturity that might not have included college. A fifth difficulty we may have with humility might be that we've seen it used by the powerful as a way to keep the less empowered down. We've seen calls for humility that seemed more interested in other people being humble than in themselves. What the poor and the oppressed need are allies that help empower them, that encourage them to pursue their power. And what they have too often gotten are songs of praise for how great it is to be humble. We have seen the voices of the self-interested powerful rebuff calls for equality as overly prideful. They should be more humble, not so arrogant as to demand any rights. People need to keep their place, we might hear. And what's going on there, of course, is that certain people have gotten used to a certain order of things, and that order works for them, and they're comfortable with it. It feels to them right and proper, so they're nervous about upsetting that order. When they meet a call for change, a call from people who have not been treated fairly to be treated more fairly, that feels like arrogance, like people arrogating to themselves improper powers and authority. There is a close logical connection between arrogating and not keeping in one's place. So the parties interested in keeping people in their place are naturally going to find it arrogant when those people express a preference for not keeping to the place to which they've been relegated. Having diagnosed the problem as one of arrogance, the privileged naturally respond by calling for humility. But the fact that this happens is not humility's fault. The moral of this story is not that humility itself is suspicious, but that humility has to begin at home and that we should especially cultivate humility against passing judgment on other people's arrogance. One of the other slogans from the recovery community that you may have heard is that when you point the finger at someone, there are three fingers pointing back at you. It's... So when we feel an impulse to regard someone else as arrogant, then it's time to examine what arrogance in ourselves might be taking such offense at someone else. The point here applies to the troublemakers in the political realm and also to those in your personal life, family members or co-workers who make trouble for you. As Pema Chodron reminds us, it's the troublemakers in your life who cause you to see that you've shut down You've armored yourself. You've hidden your head in the sand. So I've mentioned five 
difficulties we might have with humility. We might associate it with putting ourselves down. That's not what we're talking about. We might suppose that humility is superfluous, unnecessary, but I argue it's an important enabling virtue to give some attention to how our ego defenses can block development to general virtue. We might find it perplexing to self-assess our humility, but we don't need to assess it. Just stay on the path, paying attention to it. And we have achievements that we're proud of. And for many Unitarians, that's our intellect and our education. And yes, that is a difficulty, but it's one that we can, and at our best, that we do face head on and try to get over. And humility has been invoked in the interests of keeping other people in their place but the misuse of a concept doesn't mean that we throw out the concept. So let's turn now to a kind of humility that Unitarian Universalists actually have taken to heart and embody. Notice a strength of the UU way. Epistemic humility is pretty firmly etched into Unitarian Universalist DNA. Epistemic means having to do with knowledge. So epistemic humility is modesty about what we claim to know. Many of us identify as agnostic. And even if that's not our identity, we're pretty comfortable not knowing. We recognize the limitations of our own perspectives. Some of us left the church of our childhood because it seemed to claim as certainty what we just couldn't feel certain of. And we found our way to a Unitarian Universalist congregation and noticed that it doesn't deal in dogmatic certainties. Instead, here we heard things like, we see things not as they are, but as we are. And revelation is not sealed. We don't know final truth. And our understanding is ever evolving. And all of us are smarter than any of us. Perhaps we became part of a journey group and noticed the importance that Unitarian Universalists place on hearing each other's voices rather than attending to just some voice of authority. The ingrained epistemic humility of the Unitarian Universalist way was refreshing and it felt right. And so we stayed, eventually signed to the membership book and became Unitarian Universalists ourselves. From our not perfect, but pretty solid grounding in epistemic humility, we can build the attitudes of a general wholesome humility. Your particular combination of skills and talents, knowledge, memories, and insights, quirks and preferences, habits and hopes, the sound of your voice, the way you move your hand, the things that make you laugh, the things that make you cry, your face. These have never existed before altogether in one person and never will again. And here you are to bring all of who you are to this world we share, not in order to leave your mark. The world is marked up enough. Yet here you are now in your wonderful and precious uniqueness, here to be forgotten later, but here now to add your love to the onward flow of all things, to transfer forward the nutrients that have made and sustained you, and maybe filter out some of the toxins that you've also absorbed along the way. You're here to add your creative new ideas and your reiteration of favorite old ideas, your soaring dreams, and your careworn anxieties to the ongoing, regenerating, and evolving of life. May it be so. Amen. I invite you to rise in body or spirit for our closing hymn, Blue Boat Home. It's number 1064 in the Teal Hymnal, if you've got it. Otherwise, you'll see that lyric on the screen. Though below me I feel no motion Standing on these mountains and plains Far away from the Still my dry land heart can say I've been sailing all my life now Never harbor or port have I known 
deep Drifting here with my ship's companions All we kindred pilgrim souls Making our way by the lights of the heavens In our beautiful blue boat home I give thanks to the waves upholding me Hail the great winds urging me Thank you. Please be seated and we'll invite Karen up to extinguish our chalice. As we, ex as we extinguish our chalices here, our chalice here, we invite those of you at home to now extinguish your chalice and say with me the words on the screen. <laughs> uh, give it a second. Here we go. Okay. We extinguish this chalice and we carry with us the light of universal love, shining the way for ourselves and all others. These, according to legend, were the last words of the Buddha. Be ye lamps unto yourselves, be your own confidence. Hold to the truth within yourselves as to the only lamp. Go in peace. <laughs> Stay. 